So the running order for today is that we'll have a, a brief introduction. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about EduServe, uh, and then we'll review the various hybrid cloud models that we'll be discussing through the presentation. Uh, then we'll be looking at the skills and knowledge that is required to manage a hybrid cloud, whether it's done in-house or by a managed cloud services provider. Um, followed by the pros and cons and hidden costs of, of following either model. Um, a couple of case studies where we've deployed um, hybrid clouds and who's managed what under those um, under those scenarios. Uh, and then we'll look at some of the barriers to um, people adopting managed hybrid clouds and some recommendations about next steps. So a little bit about uh, EduServe. Um, why should you be giving up your valuable time to be listening to us today? Um, so we're a 27-year-old managed cloud services provider. Um, and we provide services to the public and third sector, uh, mainly central government, local government, and large charities. Uh, we were initially part of the University of Bath, providing IT services to the university, uh, and then shared services to multiple universities. We spun out about 17 years ago, and we were incorporated as a not-for-profit organization. Uh, we have about 162 staff uh, based between here in Bath and Swindon, and we provide a range of cloud migration services to help our customers migrate to the cloud around strategy, planning, architecture, design, and migration. Uh, we also provide fully managed uh, assured hybrid cloud services from our 24-7 service desk, network operation center, and security operation center. We tend to work with a small number of large clients, and some of them are listed at the bottom of the screen there, people like DFE, British Red Cross, uh, Bristol City Council, etc. So that's enough about us. Um, so now we're going to get into, into the meat of the webinar. So the first thing I'd like to do is, is to run through the various hybrid cloud models that exist, um, which doesn't just cover public-private clouds. Public-private clouds are the hybrids that people um, most commonly think of when you talk about hybrid clouds. Um, so organizations who have virtualized their IT estate uh, may put some of that estate with a hyperscale public cloud provider, people like AWS and Azure, but choose to keep some of their virtualized estate on dedicated hardware, um, which they run themselves, and they can either run that on-premise or off-premise. Um, although physical infrastructure isn't uh, really cloud, of course, um, we include it in the ecosystem because it's, uh, it's an important part of the story as you do cloud migration. And quite often when you have a virtualized estate, you still have to integrate with legacy, um, legacy physical uh, estate. It might be because you want to sweat some assets a bit longer. It may be because the applications are not suitable for, for migrating to the cloud. Then uh, what's particularly uh, relevant to uh, the public sector, to, to government, is multiple security domains. Um, so uh, you may have an information estate, and typically somewhere between 70 and 90% of that state is, uh, estate is perfectly suitable for placing in a public cloud. Uh, but you may have some um, information assets which you don't want to put in a public cloud and you need to maintain, for example, on uh, UK shores. Um, under those circumstances, you need to be able to integrate your public cloud with your UK cloud uh, across multiple security domains and do that in, a, in a, a accreditable way. Um, and then you've got multi-cloud, multi-SaaS, um, hybrid cloud. So as you migrate your IT estate from being uh, mainly on-premise into the cloud, you'll be migrating to maybe multiple cloud providers um, and to multiple uh, software as a service providers as you take your enterprise and line of business applications uh, off of on-premise. Um, you'll then want to migrate them to SaaS applications. Of course, all of those need to be integrated, and therefore they're hybrid. So um, in, in our way of thinking, uh, hybrid clouds aren't just public-private clouds, but can be any combination of the, um, of the versions that you can see on the screen there. So here's an example. Here's an organization that has an on-premise primary data center. And in that data center, they've got physical hardware, but they've also built their own private cloud, and they've integrated the two there. And they have a secondary uh, data center for DR and backup purposes um, with connectivity between the two. Uh, 
and they've adopted um, Google Docs, but it could be Office 365, Amazon Workspaces, for example. They've migrated their CRM system into a SaaS app, which is Salesforce. They've put some information estate in EduServe, and they've put their digital services in Amazon Web Services, and um, all three estates are integrated. And my uh, hybrid clouds are particularly useful uh, for supporting a cloud migration journey. So as you go from being largely on-premise to predominantly being in the cloud, very few organizations have the luxury of doing that in a big bang. So you tend to do it in business priority phases. Um, and if you have a range of cloud, hybrid cloud models at your disposal, um, the hybrid clouds that you use on your journey will change over time. To suit, to suit your requirements. So you will have an armory of hybrid clouds which can underpin your migration journey rather than your migration journey being dictated by what cloud architectures you have available to you. So you can move from being on-premise to perhaps a staging environment, co-location, uh, closing down your data center, having that uh, outsourced and managed by somebody else and then migrate from your co-location into hybrid clouds. And then finally to, to the desired end state, which is being predominantly in cloud to give you the agility, on-demand, pay-as-you-go services that you, that you need. So what, um, what sort of use cases can you use sample hy uh, uh, hybrid clouds for? So we've already spoken about one, that's the, your phased cloud migration journey, perhaps via uh, outsourced staging. Um, Multi-partner collaboration and secure information sharing. So as an example, um, under devolution, uh, more decision-making and financial control is being passed to local authorities. And local authorities are then working in partnership with health and social care providers to de deliver frontline services. So you can have your digital services used for delivering those frontline uh, health and social care services in something like uh, Amazon Web Services, where it's ideal for any device, any time, anywhere collaboration. Um, but you may have sensitive information which is uh, gathered over N3 or PSN, for example, and needs to be stored uh, either in England or on UK shores, which can be in a UK data center. Um, and then you can integrate the two so you can get the best of both worlds. Development and test environments using DevOps. Um, hyperscale public clouds um, like AWS and Azure are particularly suited to this. In the early stages of dev test, where you need to spin up and tear down environments frequently, you're not using uh, live data. Um, it makes sense to use uh, a, um, a cloud service um, such as AWS where it can be tightly integrated into your DevOps tool sets. And then as you get closer to production, pre-production, staging, for example, where live data has to be used, um, that can be done in a more secure environment uh, on UK shores. Multi-security security domain websites, applications and data centers mentioned before that you know typically between 70 and 90 percent of your state can go into a hyperscale public cloud but there's some assets which you need to keep on the UK shores um, big data analytics you know if you need to spin up large Hadoop clusters for example to do sentiment analysis perhaps a new uh, tax legislation has been introduced or a local authority has deployed some new rules around parking and they want to see what the sentiment is amongst their citizens, then you can take the fire hoses of social media feeds uh, and do big data analytics on that to get a sort of analytic view of, of sentiment. Um, and that's very well served by hyperscale public clouds. And of course, seasonally spiky workloads, the classic is the snow server, which gets hit when, uh, when the snow falls and everybody wants to know whether the school's open or the bus is running, etc. Um, you may only want to spin that up for a few days a year. Um, so to have a, a live workload humming away in the background doing nothing uh, is not particularly cost effective. So you may want to put that into a hyperscale public cloud. Uh, and for risk reduction purposes, you may want to have uh, a multi-cloud strategy because you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket. You may want to use a blend of, uh, of, of clouds. Um, and different clouds have different strengths as well. So you may want to play to the strengths of, of those cloud services. Okay, so we're going to take a, a slight breather and, and run uh, a quick poll. Um, 
now that we've sort of discussed uh, what uh, hybrid clouds mean, um, just like to, to do a quick poll, and you should have some poll buttons on your screen right now. Could you answer yes or no to the following question? Uh, is your organization currently using any hybrid cloud models? Okay, thank you very much. And, uh, and the results are um, that 57% of, of the people who are listening on the, the webinar are using hybrid clouds and 43% aren't, um, which is pretty representative as the mar of the market as a whole from, from our research. Okay, so what sort of skills and knowledge do you need to be able to run a hybrid cloud, regardless of whether it's done in-house or by a managed services provider? What sort of things do you need to, to what sort of capabilities are required to be able, be able to run a hybrid cloud? Um, so first of all, there's the onboarding. There is, uh, you know, getting your assets into the cloud and getting your people using it. So you need to have some capability to define your strategy and to put a plan together. You need to be able to architect your hybrid cloud models and, and do the design. Um, then you need to migrate uh, and adopt workloads into those hybrid cloud environments. Systems integration, as you move from enterprise application integration uh, with on-premise systems, it's similar in the cloud with some, some uh, additional challenges, but you need to be able to integrate your systems, uh, whether the, the systems you're integrating with are in the cloud as well or on-premise or on physical infrastructure. And then you need your project and program manage, management to, to efficiently and effectively execute your program. You need some sort of service desk. Um, somebody needs to be able to log incidents and requests from the users of your services, um, and then to manage those incidents and requests, requests apologies, through their, through their life cycle. Um, if you're using multiple providers who've got their own service desks, then you may need to be able to integrate your service desk operations or even integrate your service desk technology between different providers. Um, and then somebody needs to be monitoring service level agreements and reporting on those. Um, and then applying service, con uh, service management and continuous improvement so that you're continuously improving the services that uh, you're offering your end users. And then you need to have your operations delivered by a network operations center, uh, which covers service assurance and monitoring and reporting, break fixing, patching. Um, and as your estate grows organically, then you need to be able to rationalize and optimize on a periodic basis to make sure that you're maximizing utilization and minimizing capacity. Um, asset change management, as requests and incidents uh, go through their life cycle, somebody has to implement those changes. And you need to be continuously monitoring your capacity and utilization. So you're neither carrying too much capacity or you're thro throttling the end user experience by not having enough. And then finally, you have your uh, network, uh, your security operations center, where you're doing monitoring and reporting. Um, I beg your pardon. Sorry about that, press the wrong button. Uh, and then you have your security requirements to typically delivered by your security operations center um, where you need to do, undertake security monitoring, reporting, and any remediation uh, due to breaches. Um, security uh, information event monitoring, uh, including protective monitoring and DDoS protection to protect against malicious attacks. Uh, compliance and auditing, there's, uh, there's the, the range of uh, ISO standards, um, CSA, Star Alliance uh, standards, um, cyber essentials, cyber essentials plus, etc. that need to be complied with. Regular IT health checks, typically at least once a year to do penetration testing on your estate. And personnel and physical security as well. And all of that is, is underpinned by risk management and regulatory compliance. So somebody has to do all of these things if you're going to run an efficient, effective, um, and secure IT estate. So now we're going to look at uh, target operating models. Um, this is a very simplified view. Um, so given all of those capabilities that are needed, where does that get split between uh, when you're undertaking your own 
self-management of hybrid clouds versus a managed services provider doing it for you and perhaps a blend somewhere in between. So regarding people, organization and processes, if you're self-managed, uh, you uh, maintain your complete IT function. So everything on the previous slide is done by yourself, including uh, multi-supplier SLA management. If you're, if you're integrating hybrid clouds, you're typically procuring services from multiple uh, providers um, and you, you'll need to manage uh, the SLAs from those providers. If you've got a fully managed, outsourced um, hybrid cloud environment, then you would typically be managing your strategic roadmap. You'll be asking your managed services provider to, to work with you on that strategic roadmap and then to hand over for the implementation of it. Um, and you would have a stronger supplier management function. And you would typically work with a small set of providers, um, possibly not one, as in, as in the old days, the large SIs, but you'd have a small minimum viable number of providers. Small enough that it's manageable, but large enough that you've got a uh, spread of your risk uh, and you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. And a blend uh, that we've typically seen is a SIAM function, uh, service integration and management, which keeps the higher level functions. A supplier management function, um, some uh, some sort of user desk, uh, help desk uh, for end users, um, which is integrated with the service provider's um, service desk. On the governance, if you're doing it in-house, then the customer completely owns security, information assurance, green ICT, um, business continuity, regu uh, and regulatory risk. You know, uh, all of the risk profiles uh, are owned by um, the customer. Um, if it's outsourced, then the majority of the risk can be outsourced where you can benefit from the service provider's economies of scale, where they're doing the same thing for multiple customers, and so they're able to invest in a lot of the um, uh, uh, risk mitigation requirements. Uh, and in a blended environment, then you'll partially outsource some of the risk um, and keep uh, and maintain some of the risk in-house because you're, uh, you've got your own in-house SIAM function. Um, so the more you outsource, you shouldn't just be looking at outsourcing to reduce costs. You should be looking to your service providers to reduce risk or at least underpin your risk stance. And as far as technology and services is concerned, if you're doing it in-house, then you've got to run your service desk, your NOC, SOC, um, build and run your multiple hybrid cloud models. Uh, manage and deploy the complete service stack from infrastructure to platforms to software as a service um, and undertake systems integration across your hybrid cloud. Uh, if it's outsourced, then uh, your supplier uh, will provide a technology agnostic, fully managed service uh, with a single point of contact for billing, technical support, implementation, etc. So you get a service level agreement for your overall service that's been provided and uh, it's over to a managed cloud services provider in collaboration with you, with your knowledge, uh, to choose the most appropriate technology and cloud service to support your, your requirements. And in a blend, um, you may keep the end user service desk, the high level functions like service strategy, enterprise architecture, systems integration, and then manage a set of providers. Okay, just to give me a chance to have a glass of water. Um, another poll, um, so again, if you could answer yes or no, given everything you've heard about uh, what it takes to manage a hybrid cloud, do you today have the skills in-house to manage those hybrid cloud models? Okay, thank you everybody. So 71% say yes, they have got the capability, and 29% say no. Again, that's um, that's actually uh, slightly surprising, um, and it, uh, it may reflect the, and we'll come on to it at the moment, when in-house self-managed is, is preferable to, to a managed service, um, but typically the bigger you are, the bigger an organization, the bigger your, the greater your capability. Um, to be able to run that that function yourself. Okay, so um, so now we're going to look at some of the pros and cons and hidden costs of self-managing hybrid clouds uh, and outsourcing the management of them. Um, 
So first of all, the pros and cons. So if you're doing it yourself, uh, pros include the fact that you retain 100% control and you develop your own 360 degree capability. Um, uh, you have a team that's readily accessible um, and is fully flexible, so they they can uh, they can respond um, quicker typically. Um, but tends to be in a little less structured way because they are so so uh, near to hand. Um, and another pro is that you don't have any supplier lock-in or change control costs for changing from one supplier to the next. Some of the cons are that you need to skill up and and have ongoing training to maintain that capability. You need to build your full um, managed operations stack. Um, and you still probably will require some consultancy for specialist areas. You may um, take a class consultant, for example, to, uh, to manage secure your security um, <coughs> pro, um, policies. And of course, if, uh, if you've got your, whole, uh, your own in-house capability, any staff churn, if it's significant, can uh, destabilize that function. Um, and then backfilling them, uh, there's a recruitment cost associated with that. And it's quite difficult to right-size your team. If you need to expand quickly or contract, it's quite difficult to do, um, typically undertaken by having a, a core set of permanent staff and maybe some, um, you know, a flex force of contractors. Uh, the pros of outsourcing is that you have on-demand, always skilled, and evergreen service. Uh, you can transition to a, an OPEX model uh, from a CAPEX model. Um, you can manage the service around SLAs, um, and because uh, there's an SLA boundary and service boundary between yourselves and your service providers, then, um, the SLAs become even more important. It allows your in-house resources to focus on core activities. Um, you can benefit from a provider's economies of scale because they're doing the same thing for multiple customers and <clears throat> it may result in a faster cloud migration because you're working with a partner who has done it before. But the cons are that obviously you're giving up some skills and knowledge um, that are no longer inside your organization. This is if you move to a fully managed uh, operation. Um, so those skills, you're relying much more on your partners, your suppliers to, to provide some skills and knowledge. Um, and you have to move to uh, a supplier management model. Um, I've, uh, you know, I've experienced with some central government departments who've moved to uh, a more outsourced model. They've retained the in-house strategic capability, but they have a bit of a, a gap in the implementation capabilities today, which they're now looking to insource to, to build that capability back up again. Um, and typically working with uh, a provider requires some more upfront planning um, because you're basically handing over some requirements to be uh, implemented. Uh, change management reduces perceived agility. So going back to the point about um, your team, if it's in-house, being close to hand, um, there's a trade-off between outsourcing and insourcing. If, you, if you're outsourcing, it does require a little bit more planning and control and you've got your change management. Um, uh, that can be perceived to be slower uh, and often is, but the total effect may be more beneficial because you have fewer ad hoc changes and they're more structured changes aligned to a, um, a longer term uh, change strategy. Uh, and of course, if you're outsourcing, then it increases your supply dependency and, and potential lock-in, which we need to be careful about. So given those pros and cons, uh, what about the, the hidden costs? So um, if you're doing self-managed, th what people think of more often than not, 80% of the time, I'd say, is that they need to think about building the capability and the staff costs and the fact that they need to do all the hardware and software procurement themselves because it's not in a hybrid cloud. And typically, when people think about um, a managed services provider, we're moving to a monthly subscription fee, and we need to focus on supply selection um, and management. But the hidden costs that you also need to think about when building your business case is, you know, for doing it in-house is team, team churn and the, the resulting recruitment that uh, is required for that and ongoing training to keep your, your team abreast of latest technologies. Um, you need to think about the security accreditation of your staff and your services. Uh, team opportunity costs. Um, could your team be working on higher level functions uh, rather than keeping the lights on? 
uh, business opportunity costs. Um, you know, is, is your business to be uh, an IT company or is it to, to deliver public benefit? Um, so if it's a distraction, is there an opportunity cost to, to running your business? Um, it takes up office space because you've got personnel, you've got your data center, all of that is a cost. Um, potential downtime because you're not maybe managing to a strict uh, SLA as you would be with a provider. Uh, resulting security breaches because you know fixes, patches, and upgrades may not be happening in a timely manner because you've been unable to invest in the operational processes and procedures. But there's also a hidden cost with a, a, going to a managed cloud services provider. Um, everybody talks about uh, converting um, a capex to an opex, and um, I get slightly vexed when I hear um, providers say that we can save you 70%. Uh, uh, OPEX, but there is a cost to transitioning from one model to another, uh, just in the same way as there was a cost from transitioning from mainframes to client servers ar architectures, there's a cost from transitioning from physical to virtual environments as well. So the onboarding costs uh, shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, I'd like to think the total cost of ownership over a, a two to three year period will be lower um, and you get additional benefits such as agility uh, and right sizing. Um, but there is a cost to, to moving to a hybrid cloud model. And then you've got to manage your suppliers, which is, um, if done effectively, is, is um, a significant undertaking. So you need a supplier management function and also managing them against their SLAs, making sure you're getting your service credit, credits back when needed, for example. Um, change management, going through that process of formally requesting changes, going through change control boards, etc. Uh, there's a cost on, you know, to you as an organization involved in that because you need to provide some people around the table. Um, and if you need to change suppliers, there's a, a cost associated with that as well. You can't simply, simply take uh, most cloud loads unless they're the simplest things uh, and simply lift and shift them to another environment at zero cost. So now I'm going to switch to a couple of case studies just to, to, to make um, hybrid clouds a little bit more real. They, they are uh, case studies that uh, EduServe has worked on. The first being with our customer, Bristol City Council. Um, and Bristol City Council have used a hyperscale public cloud, AWS, and EduServe hybrid cloud. So their latest website is hosted in AWS. Uh, it sits on top of the LifeRay content management system. <clears throat> and they, they deliver their digital services to, to their citizens via, via the website. But it connects over a cloud connector over the internet to the services which we host in our data center um, where they can access back office systems such as you know, postcode lookup, parking services and taxi licenses um, information. And as they deliver uh, their roadmap of digital services, some of the information they're going to be accessing is going to become more and more sensitive. So the key part in this is the cloud connector, which does a step up and a step down and regulated flow of information between the two different security domains. And in terms of uh, managed service here, uh, EduServe provides the managed service around um, the estate which we host and we provide some level of managed service around the Amazon estate. So we provide a advisory around setting up their DevOps environments and setting up their AWS estate. And we do some managed services around provisioning some of those, uh, some of those um, estate elements for them. Um, but uh, a lot of the stuff in AWS is managed, managed by their digital development team so that it can be tightly integrated with their DevOps environment. At the Office of National Statistics, um, we manage um, uh, up to the operating system level uh, the cloud estate that we uh, host for them, and they completely self-manage the AWS estate. They don't procure that from EduServe, they procure it uh, directly from, from Amazon. Um, and they built a development environment where they're deploying Docker containers in both AWS and within our environment. So we've provided them with an API so they can deploy Docker into our cloud. And what that means is that they've got a continuous integration and continuous release environment where they can push um, builds into AWS during dev test and they can push them into our environment for uh, pre-prod and prod environments. 
So again, this is a very light touch managed service. Most of the managed services is being done by ONS themselves. So um, clearly, EduServe is in favor of managed services. Uh, our mission is to help our customers make, make best use of technology for public benefit as a, as a not-for-profit organization. And uh, we'd like to think that we can help with a lot of the undifferentiated heavy lifting with managed uh, cloud services. But um, as, we'll co as we'll come on to in a moment in the recommendations for next steps, it's, uh, we, we don't advocate handing everything over to a managed cloud services provider. But if or if providing a managed cloud service and, and organizations utilizing those services frees them up to do other things, why has it not been adopted more than it has been so far? So some of the barriers have been uh, maybe a lack of hybrid cloud technology knowledge. So when formulating a strategic phase migration, not having knowledge about all of the various models that are out there and the different cloud uh, services providers, the strengths and weaknesses of their, um, their offerings, um, maybe don't have the ability to do that cl cloud brokerage function for, for determining the, 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 right, the right fit for different workloads and then how to integrate those workloads together. So there, I think there's a, a lack of knowledge uh, at the moment which is improving and will improve over time but where we are today there's a bit, bit of a lack of knowledge. Uh, maybe a lack of supplier management skills. You know, keeping everything in house means that you don't have to manage supplies in terms of SLAs, um, change requests, etc. <clears throat> so it may be perceived to be easier just to 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 retain that function in house. Maybe you've done some pilot projects with cloud services providers and uh, and got burnt and didn't have a great experience. Um, or maybe it's uh, keeping the capability in house is perceived as being less risky. Um, you know, you, you, if, uh, along multiple dimensions in terms of skills, not outsourcing skills, not handing over assets to a third party, um, not having to uh, negotiate SLAs and go through the process of uh, uh, redeeming service credits and making sure you've got service continuity. Maybe it's perceived that it's better to keep doing it in-house. Um, so amount of job preservation, typically you know, in central government and local authorities and charities, they're all under massive cost pressures. Um, so you know, people are having to right size at the moment. Um, and you know, IT departments may be looking to retain as many of their staff as possible. Uh, and a good way to do that is to keep the capability in-house. Or perhaps you just don't have the bandwidth. You're too busy uh, firefighting. Uh, keeping the business running under very difficult circumstances so you don't have the bandwidth to step out of that and to, to consider uh, hybrid clouds at the moment. So it's quite, it's much easier to not change um, is another barrier. So if you are considering um, uh, hybrid clouds um, and working, uh, maybe working with a managed cloud services provider, um, of which there are many, um, and a good place to, to search for them is on G Cloud. <coughs> what, are, what are the recommendations that EduServe would make uh, as you embark on that journey? Um, have a transformation plan. You know, have a strategy that's going to take you from where you are today to where you need to be in phases. And treat it as a business drive and not an IT project. So have very clear alignment to your business priorities. Um, so have very clear mapping from your business strategy to your IT strategy. And do your phase migration according to, um, to you know, maximum ROI and reduce total cost of ownership. Um, there will be a cost upfront for doing the onboarding. Um, uh, typically, it's you know, anywhere between 25 and 50% of your first year um, cloud services OPEX in our experience, uh, just to give you a rule of thumb, but there is a, a cost. Um, so think about what your ROI period is and make sure that you get a return in that period. And don't forget change management. You're going through transformation. It's probably one of the biggest transformations in IT for some time, as I've mentioned before, probably the biggest change since going from mainframes to uh, client server models. <clears throat> and you need to take people on a journey when doing that. So there's the, the biggest challenge with going on a cloud migration journey and adopting how hybrid clouds is quite often people rather than the technology. So in summary, um, 
I would say that self-managed hybrid clouds, doing it yourself is good if your organization is large enough to be able to build and sustain that capability. Um, and where it doesn't distract from, from your core business. Um, you know, very few companies these days have a power generation plant and a water purification plant sitting outside their office to, to, to serve themselves. You know, that's done by utility companies now. Um, and cloud uh, technology is a utility model. Um, so um, if it's not a distraction from your core business and you've got the capability, then uh, why not do it yourself? Um, if not, then consider outsourcing. Um, and consider you know, going for a full managed hybrid cloud if you want to focus 100% on your business and it is a bit of a distraction having to deal with this te technology uh, and you want to be able to leverage uh, a service provider's economies of scale. But what we recommend is that you have a blend of the two, that you keep uh, some capability in-house, typically via a SIAM model, and you know, in case anybody's sucking air through their teeth at the moment and thinking that's the same as a tower model, which is, uh, which, uh, is not advocated by GDS, it's not the same thing. Um, you, know, it's, you don't have to put your service provision into towers to have a SIAM model, which is uh, integration and management of multiple providers. So we advocate keeping capability in-house, working with a provider who's prepared to share knowledge uh, and not bleed knowledge out of your organization um, so that you're in control of your own destiny um, and that you've got control of the strategic roadmap and which suppliers you choose to work with. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, we do have time for any questions. If people want to type into, into the question pane, more than happy to answer those. Uh, we will be emailing out the presentation um, uh, within a couple of days, I believe. Um, so you will be able to go through it at your leisure and share it with other people. And there's my contact details on the last, last slide if you want to reach out to us and, uh, uh, and have a conversation. Um, alternatively, go via our website, but um, I do hope that you found it uh, useful, um, thought-provoking, um, and I'd really welcome any feedback via email um, if, if you'd be care enough, uh, kind enough to share that with me. Um, we're very quiet on the questions. Um, ah, here we go. How does a hybrid cloud differ from web ops, or is it simply terminology? Um, so web ops, presumably by that you mean DevOps, um, web operations. Uh, the term is different um, because if you're a greenfield organization, you may not use hybrid clouds at all. You may put your entire estate in AWS, for example. If you're a Microsoft um, consumer, heavy Microsoft consumer, you may put everything in Azure. So I would say that hybrid clouds is a, is, is a dimension which sits underneath your web and DevOps. Um, and typically, people use hybrid clouds because they have uh, a, they're on a journey and they're partway between where they are today and where they need to be. I think in the future, hybrid clouds in 10 years' time will be very rare, even in five years' time, perhaps. But where we are today, people are migrating to the cloud, so they need to be able to do that in phases, so they need to have uh, multiple cloud offerings. Once you've got your estate, you can then layer DevOps, WebOps uh, on, top, on top of that, um, whether it's single cloud or multiple clouds. Okay, so, ah, okay, here we go, hold on just a second. Should the technology stack of the cloud provider be considered when comparing vendors? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I sat in a very interesting um, presentation by Gartner very recent, recently who talked about bimodal um, IT, uh, where you have mode one, which is uh, typically ITIL, um, um, fixed technology versus mode two, which is more DevOps, uh, hyperscale public clouds. And one of the things that they were advocating was that um, you treat the two separately. You don't try and put a single pane of glass across everything. Um, and that extends to the technology that the provider 
is uh, implementing their, their virtualized estate with. So, for example, um, if you're worried about lock-in with somebody like AWS or uh, Azure, you need to have a look at the capabilities and find out which uh, of, the, you know, out of their offerings, which one is most suited to your requirements. As I say, if you're, if you're a strong Microsoft house, then you may go for Microsoft, uh, otherwise you might go for AWS, and if you've got some uh, UK data sovereignty requirements, you may go with uh, one of the main providers on, on G Cloud. So, um, you shouldn't, the, Gartner are advocating that you shouldn't be worried about lock-in, you shouldn't uh, be concerned about uh, providing a single pane of glass across multiple providers. You should leverage the capability of the cloud provider, which means you should consider how uh, they implement their cloud technology. So look at your requirements, look at the requirements of various providers, and unless you're only after pure IaaS, compute, storage, and networking, then there are a range of other services that each provider provides, and you need to choose a provider that's got the best match between those services and what you need. Um, what Gartner was not advocating was to produce um, uh, cloud orchestration and aggregation across multiple cloud technologies where you don't have to think about the underlying um, features of, of the cloud because then you'll end up pandering to the lowest common denominator. And, and yes, you'll be able to migrate your workloads around uh, and you won't have to think too much about what the underlying technology is, but you won't be leveraging a full capability. What they're advocating is look at the features, map them onto your requirements, commit to how many cloud providers you need to uh, undertake your, your migration, and then if you need to migrate to somebody else later on, then bear the cost then. So in summary, Yes, you need to look at the underlying technology from different cloud providers to be able to, to make best use, otherwise you'll, you'll work to the lowest common denominator across all of them. How do you manage single sign-in on and authentication in a multi-cloud environment? Um, that is possibly a little bit too technical for, for me. Um, I can uh, band of some stuff around, but uh, if you don't dug a little bit deeper, I wouldn't be able to. I, I could, you know, I could easily be challenged on it. But um, we provide single sign-on uh, via um, technologies like OAuth and Shibboleth, and, uh, and in fact, we have our own single sign-on IAM product in-house, which we uh, sell to to, to libraries. Um, so you can provide single sign-on uh, across multiple cloud providers. Um, how it happens, I don't know. But if you'd like to, to drop me a line, then I can get somebody who can answer that question for you in, in more detail. Great, so we're up, we're up on the 45 minutes now. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Uh, said I hope you found it useful. And um, if you need any more information or you want to dig a little bit deeper uh, in some of the questions, then please feel free to get in contact and um, we'll do our best to oblige. Thank you very much.